I hope it will be plain to people by now that Hitler's economic miracle is the greatest myth in human history. There was no economic miracle. There are no miracles. And if there are, why can't the Germans do it all again now? If you want to construct a network of new roads and new steelworks and new factories, you need one thing, money. You need investment. And the investment didn't come from Hitler. It came from Brown Brothers Harriman and their business associate, Fritz Thiessen. It came from Jalmar Schacht and his best friend, Sir Montague Collett Norman. It came from men like Axel Wenegren, the Swedish multimillionaire arms manufacturer, and Charles Bedeau, the French business mogul. These people were all in the same bed with their Nazi friends, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the Dulles brothers, Prescott Sheldon Bush, and George Herbert Walker, with whom they'd created the Union Bank for laundering Nazi money. And with stage one of their plan for world domination complete, they now turned to the second phase, which was meant to be the overthrow of American democracy and the imposition of fascist government upon the United States. In order to pull this off, these Nazis raised money from America's richest families, many of whom, in this new consumerist society, had become household names. The Colgate family, the Birdseye family, the DuPont family, the Rockefeller family. These people handed over millions to the American financiers of Hitler so they could hire, train and supply a private army which would attempt to overthrow the democratically elected government of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and impose fascist dictatorship in America. Of course it's natural to wonder, considering they had such advantages, how on earth they failed to pull it off. The simple answer is that they chose the wrong man because their choice to lead this Nazi insurrection was Major General Smedley Darlington Butler, the most decorated soldier of the period and in all of American history, perhaps the most unsung hero of all. Because Smedley Butler was the most genuine Democrat and lover of liberty the world has ever seen. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under the subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institution. I want to retain the right to vote, I the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. Smedley Butler tricked the plotters into thinking he was interested for just long enough until he was sure who all the major players were, and then he told the president. This put FDR in a quite impossible position. America at that time was just coming out of the Great Depression. The last thing he wanted was to cause another economic downturn, and he feared that if he scooped up all the leading bankers and captains of industry in the United States and threw them all in jail, the country just might fall apart. So what could he do? To Smedley Butler's utter incredulity, he chose, in the end, to do nothing. In spite of the fact that these men had committed treason and should have been hanged, their power was such that they were not even charged, let alone tried, and so great was their influence they were able to keep America out of the war until December the 7th, 1941. <laughs> With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt finally realized he had to do something. His response was the Trading with the Enemy Act, which allowed him to seize assets like the Union Bank, through which Bush, Walker and Harriman had been financing Thiessen. Roosevelt didn't realize, however, that it was already a case of too little, too late. 